Hey gang, welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I'm Jason Verlindi, the editor of the Fretboard Journal magazine. As always, that's John Rauhaus playing in the background. And every week on this show, I try to talk to someone interesting from the world of guitars. It could be an incredible player. Last week, I talked to Richard Thompson. It could be an incredible guitar maker. Or it could be someone who just makes something cool that I want you to all know about. And that's the case with this week's episode. I'm talking to Michael Lux and Dan Orkin, who are the co-producers of this amazing two and a half hour long movie that Reverb.com just released called The Pedal Movie. Now, The Pedal Movie is available everywhere by the time you are listening to this on iTunes and Google Play and Vudu. You can read up on it at thepedalmovie.com. I watched it. I was riveted. It covers everything from those early recording studio mistakes that some engineer decided they actually liked the sound of, all the way up to sort of the modern juggernaut of the boutique pedal industry today. This is a facet of the guitar universe that I wish I knew more about. I wish I had the time to dedicate myself to. But I find fascinating. I mean, there are hundreds of amazing pedal builders today building unique, interesting things. And uh, it really kind of demystified that world for me. So if you're like me and want to know what is going on with all of these effects pedals, want to know why your YouTube feed is filled with pedal demos, you might want to check it out. And even if you're not one of those people, it's a great movie. I think you will love it. So Again, I'll include a link to it in the show notes, but it's available on iTunes and Google Play and Vudu if you're a Vudu user now. Um, Before I get to that, I guess I should remind you all that we do a whole bunch of podcasts here. And if you're listening to this one and presumably have an electric guitar or two, I'll remind you that I'm the co-host of the Truth About Vintage Amps podcast. And our latest episode, I think it was episode 68, has special guest Jeff Brown of Southside Guitars. So in addition to Skip Simmons, my co-host, troubleshooting everyone's amps and uh, helping them play as best as possible, we got Jeff's advice too, and it was a super fun episode. That is a show that is uh, thoroughly informative. I learned so much from it. I'm the dumb guy. I'm the Ed McMahon on that show. Uh, It's super informative, but it's also a lot of fun. It's not dry. It's not super boring. Skip wouldn't let it be. So I hope everybody will check that out. I also hope you will check out and uh, say hi to our sponsors for this episode. First up is Mono Cases. You can go to monocreators.com to read about their entire lineup of pedal boards and pedal board bags, studio monitor stands, and of course, gig bags and all points in between. We are also sponsored by Folkway Music. I want to encourage everybody to go check out Folkway Music's YouTube channel. In addition to being one of the great guitar stores in North America, they're putting out some incredible video content. And Mark Stepman, the owner of Folkway, gets all these amazingly cool, rare, vintage Gibson acoustics because he's sort of that guy. And he does really informative deep dives into uh, what what work he's doing on them, how they are constructed, I've learned a lot from those videos. Speaking of weird old Gibsons, our third sponsor is Retrofred Vintage Guitars. And uh, right now they have a 1935 custom ordered Gibson Jumbo that is like crazy deluxe. It's got fingerboard inlay and a unique pick guard. And uh, just go check it out and see everything that they have at Retrofred Vintage Guitars. They just had two guitars from my buddy Bill Frizzell. They sold within seconds, but they are constantly getting amazing new arrivals. So check out retrofret.com and tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. Uh, Speaking of the Fretboard Journal, the Fretboard Journal proper, the paper edition, and now the PDF edition, uh, everybody out there has been enjoying the latest 47th issue of that. And we're hard at work on our 48th issue, which is going to mail out next month. So if you have not subscribed to the magazine yet, please go do so. You can use the discount code podcast and I will take $5 off of your order for the digital or the print edition. You know, we're trying to make the world's greatest guitar magazine, simply put. We're trying to make something thoroughly unique, unlike every other guitar magazine out there. We love all the guitar magazines, but we want to make something that will stand the test of time and have stories and photography 
you're not going to find anywhere else. So it's been an amazing challenge. It's been an amazing ride of 15 years. I look forward to the next 15 as we creep upon our 50th issue. We're looking at some cool redesigns and some fun new features and columns that you definitely haven't seen before anywhere. So uh, please, please, please join us, support us. Again, you can go to fretboardjournal.com and just click on the subscribe tab. It's $44 for a year of print issues, four issues. And I promise you, you're going to love it. I guarantee it. So uh, I hope you will join us. All right, without further ado, here is my talk with Michael Lux and Dan Orkin from Reverb.com. Again, the movie is called The Pedal Movie. And if you're listening to this podcast, it's pretty much safe to say you are a guitar geek. And if you are a guitar geek, it's also safe to say you will really enjoy watching this movie. So check it out. Thanks for doing this, guys. I just watched this epic creation that you guys did. And I mean epic. I mean two hour, almost two and a half hours long. Yeah. Which, which was uh, <laughs> insane. My first thought as a video editor on the sides, like, oh, my God, how did they log all this footage? How many layers deep did this premiere file go but we don't need to bore people to tears yet about that why don't we first start with just like how, when did this idea to make this movie come about and 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 why uh sure i can i'll start off michael and then feel free to interrupt me anytime um the the origins of this project were really um in re at reverb sort of at this nexus within the gear industry and pedal industry specifically we knew a lot of people who we had worked with who were um, part of this kind of wave of like boutique pedals that, you know, as is explained in the movie, really hit its stride, like the mid aughts and like 2010, the 20 aughts, the mm -hmm. 10 aughts, the, <laughs> the last, last couple of decades. And um, we were thought it's such a cool story. Like how does, how does this industry go from being like 10 companies to like 10,000 companies in the course of just a few decades? That's like, that's like a crazy story. Like it kind of happened with, with like micro brewed beer and a few other things like that, but like not so many people know about guitar pedals and they're such like an interesting part of the musical culture and, and how music gets made. So we basically started filming what you might call like oral history interviews, kind of thinking, where is this going to go as people, we'd be doing other projects or like at NAMM um, and just started going from there. And that was about two years, two and a half years ago or so. And, um, and then eventually decided that we wanted to kind of pivot and, and, and talk about the full story and kind of rewind all the way back to like the 60s, 50s and 60s. But the origin of it really was a matter of like, we know all these cool people who are part of this amazing story of like where the boutique pedal industry came from, where we really want to help celebrate that culture. Yeah. And that story. And beyond that, you know, we were so used to uh, storytelling, frankly, at Reverb. And I think one of the, one of the big sort of light bulb moments for us was realizing, you know, we, Dan and I have been big pedal, you know, enthusiasts since the nineties. Um, and th this sort of realization as we, as we talked, built more relationships with artists, with builders, with brands that, that you know, the, the public people know about effects pedals, but do they know about the people behind the effects pedals. And so, you know, very quickly we set out to essentially make a film that's a really human film and not not really a, a technical film, right, about pedals. It's really about the people. Sure. As, as someone who's, you know, we've dabbled in this little universe our own, but not to the extent with none of the resources that you guys have, was there a decision... I could see this going two ways. You could have done the Anthony Bourdain style. We're going to go on a road trip and do these little weekly episodes where we visit Chase Bliss this week and then we go there next week. Was there a, a conscious moment where you're like, okay, this is going to be a full length film. We're going to make this something that could be actually seen at a theater. Yeah, I think it, I think the, to be honest, I think this, the change, this, the, the, uh, the decision of like, this is a film really came uh, when we talked to Josh Scott. Shout out to Josh Scott. Um, yeah. And we all know, you know, Josh is a phenomenal historian, um, you know, and in talking to him, 
a conversation that probably was focused on one side of the industry turned into like a four or five hour interview. And because of that, uh, we, we quickly realized like this, this is a, a really interesting story just beyond, you know, this pedal came out, then this pedal came out, then this pedal came out, um, really digging into uh, the stories behind the pedals and, and then how they influence artists really was the impetus for us to be like, this is a story worth telling. Yeah. And it's, I think what Michael's, it's like, it's like um, there is both the kind of micro where there are really compelling stories like the Chase Bliss guy, you know, mm-hmm. Earthquaker, whatever it is, where you can kind of zoom in and that's really great. And that would lend itself to like a, uh, more so than Anthony Bourdain, what we always joke about is that show, The Chef's Table. Yep. You ever see that on Netflix? Of course. Where I always have in The Chef's Table, there's always like a shot where they like walk through like a field of like okra or like, you know, corn or whatever. And I was like, <laughs> just imagine a picture of like Jamie Stillman or Josh Scott walking through like a field growing like transistors and like picking the ripe transistor <laughs> off the plant. Anyway, digression. Totally. Um, so I think what I was saying though is like, it's like, there's just as much value at kind of zooming out and telling the cohesive story. And who knows, maybe the next project is the zoomed in chef's table, you know, story. And I think we tried to get a good balance of that. The struggle, and this is probably apparent to anybody who's seen it already, but like, is like, um, is like telling the generalized story while still giving enough details. It is simply not possible to tell the story of every single pedal company in the context of the film, but, and so there's hard decisions where we can't interview everybody. We can only focus on this, but hopefully the ones we are focused on and the sort of sub stories and chapters we tell are um, emblematic of the whole, you know, telling it, it, sort of like using the specific examples selectively in a way that tells this, this overarching story. I mean, you know, there's a part in the, in the film where we have a few people talk about learning about um, soldering from forums in like the late nineties or whatever. Um, you know, for every one person on screen talking about that, there's like, you know, a dozen other people who could say the similar sort of experience, but you don't need to have every single. And that's really that, that, that dynamic is, you know, where the editing challenge, I think really, really lives. Yeah. Uh, was there anyone that you really wanted to get a hold of? You just couldn't, or there were time constraints or something? Yeah. I mean, well, COVID, I mean, we were still filming up until la- a year ago, like last okay. spring. And we had this one last kind of hurrah, um, plan to kind of last minute, let's get everybody for like April of, maybe it was May of last year, where we were going to go to New York and film um, all day with electro harmonics. We were going to do stuff with Eventide, which sadly didn't, and out and COVID kind of upended that. Um, similarly, we were at that same time period, we were doing some work to try to interview a few more folks in the UK, mm-hmm. um, including uh, Roger Mayer we were, we were talking to, um, and sadly, just with all the Sanity and having to kind of just move on to editing um, more um, assertively, that was sort of left on the table. So I would say in terms of people we missed out on, unfortunately, I would say some of those kind of key historical folks um, was definitely the what comes to mind for me first. Was there a deadline you guys were trying to hit and around a particular release date or something? Or was it just like, we got to be done with this. We put so many hours into it. This is our, this is our drop dead date. Um, Dan and I are used to deadlines. We love deadlines. We worked on deadlines for years. So sure. we, uh, even though we knew this was a really ambitious project, you know, all in all, it probably did take over two and a half years. Um, <laughs> we knew we, we wanted we originally did want it to come out, uh, you know, in 2020 and it probably would have had an up and for COVID. So, you know, there's just a lot of complications and, and the entire film industry felt this exact same thing. So, um, it's not uh, unique to, to us. Um, but also, you know, once that happened, we, we were, we were able to, you know, really hunker down and focus on making the best film possible. Um, and that is really like what we were focused on. So yeah. we didn't want to just, you know, put something out that we didn't feel super proud of that was uh, as finished as we wanted it to be. Yeah. And then what I was sort of mentioning earlier about the kind of pivoting towards telling the full historical story as opposed to just kind of like the original title of the sort of working title of the project, like the original email chains were like, um, 
like the rise of boutique pedals or something like that. It was like very focused on like the modern stuff. So even though that, that kind of redirection happened, you know, not, not like relative, like sort of in the middle of the whole process. Um, I think like, if you watch the original teaser we put out, uh, from Nam like a year and a half ago, or however long it was, it was very much still in that like later mode. So I think kind of the refocus to tell the full story um, took a bit longer. You know, added, yeah. added to that original timeline. Bit. You guys did an incredible job. I am not nearly as well versed on pedals as I probably should be, but uh, I mean, I learned a ton. The the history, the interviews, uh, they were it was great. It was, it was thanks really so cool. much. Yeah, I mean. Uh, Talk to me a little bit. You kind of mentioned a little bit about, you know, people going on to Usenet groups and and finding schematics. But, like, what did change when, you know, we we had early effects? And you guys really do a great job documenting this. The early effects were almost like happy little mistakes. And then somebody's like, how do we replicate that mistake? Then you've got the boss era and, and you know, the, the mainstream pedal era. What What took place in the 90s that got a bunch of people doing this? I, I mean, I love this question. And like I, and like I said, this was the original like thesis of the, of the project. So cut me off, but uh, <laughs> I, I would say two things. One is, and as this is something that people quote in the movie a bit is sort of like the reaction against like the eighties and the nineties with grunge and like, obviously popular music taste and popular music gear taste go very hand in hand. So there's sort of that table setting where alternative music, uh, rock music, heavier rock music becoming more popular and you can't understate the influence of a Kurt Cobain on a generation mm-hmm. or even a Jay Maskus or, you know, somebody who's maybe like less of a household name, um, but it's still very well known in like these. So I think that was sort of like the the spark. And then I think that spark hit the powder keg of the Internet. I mean, you really can't get away from the fact that the Internet and the Internet is a few things, all of which, you know, we, we cover a bit, but it, it's worth emphasizing is that. One, it gives people the know-how. And additionally, it gives people the parts. Like it makes it so that the actual mechanics of learning how to make a pedal and building a pedal, um, the barrier to entry to that just, you know, goes way down. People could do it beforehand. You have Craig Anderton and books and, and DIY stuff existing, but the immediacy of the internet, you know, that's not unique to pedals, but pedals are a, are a textbook example of that dynamic of like business and culture and, and DIY uh, ethos. And then the other end of it, once you figure out how to build that pedal, you can market it through the internet really effectively. And then I think from there, where it's led more recently is that there's sort of this um, self-perpetuation that happens where the more people who are interested in pedals and these sounds that they create, the more people there are going to be building pedals to cater to that. And it just kind of keeps on snowballing and going and going till we get to today where, you know, if the pedals in the 70s were kind of replications of happy accidents and were fairly simplistic, um, and it was more about, you know, enha- I mean, you, you know, as you can see, it's more about like enhancing the tone of your guitar or kind of expanding it a bit to today where you have pedal brands like Maris or, um, Strymon or, or, um, you know, or Montreal assembly. There's a lot of them where the pedals are sort of the instrument onto themselves. Like, I think that's the kind of like logical progression from like, pedals are this hobby that people are increasingly interested in. And now the pedal is the end goal of the musical activity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I, one of the takeaways I got from this movie was like, you know, pedals used to be responsive to the popular music trends. There was a boss grunge pedal or a metal pedal. And now I look at the world of pedals and it's like, they're making pedals for music that doesn't exist. Like in two years, there's, we're going to be bored with all the albums that are like a Chase Bliss mood pedal because everyone's got yeah. one now and they all have this brilliant idea and they, they might all sound different or they might all sound alike, but uh, the pedals are coming before the end goal, I guess. Uh, the other the other thing that was uh, interesting in the movie was, was that, you know, the effect the recession had on this, which was actually kind of a positive effect. Do you want to riff on that for a second? Yeah. Th- I mean, this was something that kind of came out of left field for us and was, was a learning experience for us. And one of those, um, kind of, uh, interesting tangents that you don't realize, uh, you're not writing it in, you're not asking questions about it. It just pops up. Um, so that was an interesting thing and really, yeah, I mean, it, it does make a lot of sense. You see that without the recession, the effect of boom, as we know, it may not have happened quite the same way. And, 
once we started interviewing Brian Wampler about this, uh, or once he brought it up, once Josh brought it up, uh, Felipe from Caroline, et cetera, I think Dan and I both realized, oh, this was also true for us. Like in 2008, we, we, we bought pedals too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because we couldn't afford an amp at the time. We couldn't afford uh, a new guitar. So I think you really, uh, I think a lot of people will identify with that if they were playing uh, or involved in the industry at that time. Um, and it is, a, it, it's an undeniable uh, truth because you do see so many brands really start to come out of that, that era when, when they realize like, oh, this, this is where, this is where it's moving. Mm-hmm. And if, if you look at like, um, like Vintage Guitar Magazine has their like annual index of vintage guitar pricing, which is a good kind of barometer. It's like, it, it stacks up perfectly where it's like the recession vintage prices go, you know, go down a bit, but are still pretty like the, the market for all these sort of higher end goods gets pretty soft because people are a little bit more protective of their disposable income. But, you know, it's, it's not super hard to justify spending a hundred dollars or even hundred dollars on a pedal, um, especially, and you know, like this is before reverb existed, but certainly the market still existed on other plot, you know, eBay or, or just locally or whatever with a pedal is like an easy commodity to, to, sell again so you kind of get this like flipper kind of thing where it's like easy to kind of try buy and try and that has another kind of exacerbating effect on like the thirst for that world yeah this question is uh alluded to in the towards the end of the movie and and not really answered which is very appropriate but but do you guys think that there's an end in sight to this pedal boom. I mean, is it slowing down? Is it, has it plateaued? Does it just continue to rise? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, maybe eventually, but like, um, an interesting parallel to this is like, there's a really cool book I have around here somewhere. Um, I think it's called the instrument collector. I'd have to, I'd have to check on this, but it's like a book that was published in like 1979 or 1980 or something that features a bunch of people who are like vintage guitar dealers back then. And it's all about, oh my, I cannot believe how much a 60 Stratocaster costs nowadays. It's cost a thousand dollars. And it's like this just like, and, and they're asking the same questions. Is this vintage guitar craze going to going to die off? This was in like, the vintage guitar market didn't like actually like take off until like the mid nineties. Like this is years before that. So the point is that people are always predicting the the decimation of of collectors markets and I, I i don't want to sound reductive and say that the pedal industry is a collectors market because i think unlike a lot of collectors market there's actually like utility and people do it for like the music and everything it's not just about having something but there's certainly similarities you know they, they come in cycles and they come in waves but there's always doomsdayers who are expecting the end of it and in terms of the pedal industry specifically i mean like i was just saying a, a little bit ago like the change from like, I have a pedal that's going to make my amp sound louder, or I, it's going to delay my tone and it's a utility to like a full fledged, you know, eight knobber that can like do a million things. And it's sort of the instrument into itself. I think that's just getting started in a lot of ways. Like I sure. think, and especially when you look at things like modular synthesis or synthesis in general, where there's a ton of creativity in the music made, um, the more people kind of push the boundaries of like how they're using these sounds and tools, the more that those tool creators are going to make new tools to kind of like match that race kind of dynamic. So I think there's still a lot of runway in that. And I think more and more, you're going to see pedal companies that are embracing pedals as the instrument and the ends in and of itself, as opposed to just. Another big testament to pedals longevity currently is that we're really only recently seeing uh, effects being adopted en masse on non-guitar instruments. And so once you start seeing, uh, you know, accordionists, <laughs> which is a yeah. real thing, a real thing, you know, and harpists and obviously synthesizer players, et cetera. I mean, we know saxophone players and trumpet yeah. players that, that use these effects. And so really we're talking about effects, you know, kind of transcending guitar and kind of falling into, you know, what could be the zeitgeist of future music essentially on, on other instruments. And so, yeah, I don't see an end in sight. <laughs> yeah. 
Fun fact, the only artist to ever come through the Fretboard Journal who did not want their pedal board photographed, Sam Gendel, the horn player. Ah, interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. One of the th- one of the good takeaways that I got from the film, and there were a whole bunch, was just um, thinking about pedals. And this speaks to the human interest side of, of you know what you guys were trying to capture. Thinking about pedals as the personality behind the pedals. I think maybe Josh said that. I, I can't remember uh, exactly who. Hopefully it was Josh. Um, are we starting to see fewer, and maybe you guys don't know, but like, are we starting to see people no longer like, I'm going to make a, a great spring reverb pedal? Are they now trying to move away from the core classics and like find their own voice? Do you feel? I think that's a really, really great question. And it's, it's, it's so it's the answer is sort of like all of the above. Like, I don't think it's, it's like, I think you're always going to have people who are making classic spring reverbs or even more basic than that. Just like a fuzz pedal, like the yeah. simplest circuit, right? Like the way that we, I, I've heard this, this is not, I'm not a, like I've heard other people say this before. It's like, if you think about it more as like a recipe than like a invention, it's like, there's only one recipe for like, you know, an IPA, but there's like, hundreds of thousands of different IPA beer bottles and labels out there because like there's, you know, slightly different variation. So on the one hand, you have people who are not necessarily, I mean, they're pedal fans, but maybe they're just obsessed with finding the perfect overdrive and they'll go through a hundred different overdrives. I know those people, you know, those people. Mm -hmm. And that's like a fun activity. And it's like, yeah, it's musical and they're playing it and that's part of it, but they also love the quest. So I think there is room for that variation. But I also think that like, um, Keep going. You're like, uh, oh, you're good. Um, but I, I also think that like, there is a certain like um, spin that people want to put on things. So maybe it's an overdrive that has some built-in special feature. I can't. I'm not a pedal designer, so I can't tell you a good special feature idea because if I did, I would. But <laughs> um, you know, maybe it's a spring reverb that has MIDI control over the springtime or something like that. Like. That, uh, one of our really interesting interviews, it's a shame that we didn't really have the space to go into it in too much detail in the film, but one of the really great interviews we did was with uh, Roger uh, Smith of Source Audio, who's like brilliant, like engineer of this stuff. And we talked to him about this a bit and he was telling us about all these like different ideas that they have talked about or other people have talked about in terms of like MIDI interaction and MIDI control and digital control over pedal parameters. And it's like this whole other like, galaxy of like mm-hmm. interesting tech that nobody's really doing a ton of. And, um, and it's like, that's like a whole other area that once that comes out, there's going to be people who are like interested in getting all of that and making sure that all of their analog pedals or digital or whatever it is, have that like connectivity. level. So I just think there's like, there's a lot of room left to kind of um, bellish and like keep going. Yeah. Now you've totally overwhelmed me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it's interesting because if you go, you know, just talking about personality, uh, you know, personality being inserted into effects design. I mean, think about, just pick a genre, think about rock and roll. Okay. Uh, you know, think about the amount of notes that you have and now think about, you know, thousands of bands that put their own spin on it. It's really their personality. Right. And so it's, it's not dissimilar from effects pedals. Like, you know, you might be working with uh, a sort of genre of pedal. But really, I mean, you change one thing, you change two things, and that instantly becomes usable for a different person or a different type of sound. Um, and so, yeah, I th- it, the variation is is really interesting, the, the, the personality aspect within the design. A question I have for you guys is, you know, you, you touched a little bit upon, you know, some, some pedals that ended up not making it, you know, or, or just circumstances that were weird. The, the guy from Guild who died right before the Mutron. Um, what, having met all these pedal builders and seeing their workshops, some of which are vast and amazing, and some of which are probably like a closet, what are the character traits of the folks who made it? Like, what does it take to actually become a Josh Scott or... Uh, Joel from Chase Bliss versus the folks who are just kind of toiling away. I, th- I think something that, that I'm I'm going to paraphrase a few different interviews because we we ha- this came up in some of the interviews, sort of this general line of line of thought. And I think um, 
basically, I think the commonality is people who are doing it for passion and are doing it because they love tinkering and they love inventing. And, and pedals is one of those amazing things where it's like on one level, especially early on, it's like engineering, you know, it's like really mathematical almost. And then, but it's also art, you know, you're also making like our pedals art. I would absolutely argue that they, they are like a hundred percent. And like any other creative endeavor or artistic endeavor, if you set out to sell a million copies of your, you know, CD and you're, or nobody buys a million anymore, but <laughs> you, you set out to get a million streams of Spotify of your single, mm-hmm. like that's not really going to necessarily amount to much, but if you're doing it because you love the sound you're making, or you love in this case, the pedal you're making, that's what keeps you going. Even if maybe you don't sell out immediately of all the ones you build. So I think that's a theme that came up a lot is like, you'd have to be, you'd have to be crazy to get into an industry that's like this competitive or this, you know, backbreaking, um, if you didn't love it. And I think a lot of the people who make it are the ones who kind of hold to that sort of guiding principle. Talk to me, Michael, about just the actual editing process of this. Like, were you also having to do all the day-to-day reverb videos while you were trying to wrap your head around this thing? Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, man. And, and I mean, the good, you know, the great thing about about this film is that it was really being done in tandem with a lot of content we were already doing. So, um, you know, if we would do a fly date uh, to New York to go do something with X artist or a lot of the time we were actually going to do something with these brands. We would just be able to schedule things out. And so we were really able to also a lot of these folks travel to Chicago uh, all, sure. all the time for, for dealers, for shops, um, for uh, uh, workshops, all of the above. And so uh, it was really uh, a great blessing to be able to work all of this stuff in as we were, working on our day-to-day content. Um, I have to shout out John Gagan, who is our lead editor on this, an animator who worked just incredible amounts of time. (laughs) I can't even Mm -hmm. clock how many hours. I mean, um, Dan and I really spent a lot of time, you know, once we had almost finished wrapping, uh, taking about 150 hours of footage into, uh, you know, the script, essentially taking those 150 hours and, you know, drilling them down into what we thought would be relevant. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, John was really the one that, uh, sat there day and night while the rest of our team was sort of carrying on. Um, and yeah, the, the result that you see is, is just as much a product of his work as it is, uh, Dan and I's. Yeah. You guys mentioned, um, and I'm sure there's like hundreds of hours of this, but you mentioned some some stuff that didn't make it in the video or in the full length movie. Are there any plans to release some of that footage? Yeah, well, some of it's actually already on the Reverb YouTube channel. Um, my I saw the women pedal with uh, Emily. Yeah, so that yeah. that was really cool. We're excited to come out, and that that's you know there's some commonality in what's in that with what's in the film, but it's it's a bit you know more. Uh, uh, detailed. Um, but there's some other good stuff. A really good example would be, um, we did one of my favorite interviews we did was with, uh, Mike Beagle, who is one of the founders of, uh, Musitronics, like, you know, arguably one of the most influential pedal companies period back in the day. Um, so we knew that we couldn't tell his entire story in the, um, in the film. So there's a short version, but there's a longer spinoff version of that on the YouTube reverb YouTube channel, which is from the same interview. And there's been a couple other ones like that. Um, and I think there's a, you know, we'll probably, um, particularly like some of the artist stuff too. Like there's a few of the artist interviews we did where we talk about their life in pedals is like really interesting. I think people would find it fascinating, but obviously within the narrative of the film, it only is sort of tangential. So there's, there's a lot on the cutting room floor that kind of speaks to that. Yeah. I imagine, because I feel this way, like you do all these interviews with these pedal builders, you probably get swept up in their story and end up wanting to buy buy one of their products, even if it, you don't have any use for it. Definitely. Um, I, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge, um, <laughs> for sure. And, 
especially when like, you know, I won't like, there's a lot of companies that, I mean, there's no mystery. A lot of these are small businesses and a lot of them are like single person operations with like families and like um, the same way that, you know, when you see your friend's band release an LP, like you want to, you don't, it's like, yeah, I could listen to that on spot of, you know, what our band camp, or maybe they'll just give me a copy. No, I want to buy this because like, I want the art you're putting into the world to like continue. <laughs> so like, yeah. um, you know, I think there's a lot of parallels between pedal making and like making records, of course. Um, but it's the same. It's definitely the same kind of mentality of like wanting to support people who are doing awesome stuff. And that exists between the pedal companies too. Like they all, that's what's, I mean, that's so cool. Like this industry is so like, there's such like a fellowship around it. Like they all root for each other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on, on our little universe, we see that with like acoustic guitar builders. They're all sharing tools and insights and like, oh, I got wood from here. But it definitely seems like the pedal folks, you know, all are rooting for each other. It's really cool. Yeah. I think there's definitely a mentality of like a high tide lifts all ships and like, um, you know, the more people that get into pedals in general, like are going to be, you know, it's, it, there's not... Um, it's in everybody's interest. And this this exists, I mean, I've had a lot of these conversations within the world of like modular synthesis and Eurorack, where with that, even it's even more acute. It's even more of a dynamic of like, there's a barrier to entry to understand how this works. The more people we can get into the field, like the better it is for everybody. So let's all work together. Like um, same, same kind of uh, patterns. Are there any more uh, feature length reverb films on the horizon? I certainly hope so. Not in the, not in the near future. Uh, I'm just incredibly psyched that we were able to do this one for right now. <laughs> Are there ideas being tossed around though? Um, I mean, I think we should, we were joking with Blake, our good friend from uh, the Tone Mob podcast, because he always asks people about um, pizza preferences at the end of his podcast <laughs> that we were going to make the pizza movie next which is maybe a little left out of left field for reverb but i think it'd be fascinating <laughs> to take basically the exact same approach but like interview all these like contemporary like pizza artisans maybe There's i just have a table for you yeah uh, maybe i'm just hungry i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is there good pizza in scotland shockingly there is not although and this, <laughs> this sound there this sounds like a punchline but it's 100 percent true at the grocery store and like the refrigerated food section you can get haggis pizza readily of course well this is why you've taken to bread making you've got to diy it well that's the other thing michael michael and i have joked about the about the bread movie being my next uh my next fashion it's like um i think that may have been done but yeah that's exactly right (laughs) necessity the mother of invention well very cool guys i love this movie i just got to tell you it was it was really cool to see some familiar faces and then some not some familiar faces and like I said I I learned a ton and uh, I got to be honest when I first opened I'm like two and a half hours but it flew by so oh good nice well thank you well we've also we'll have to make the the Lord of the Rings esque director's cut where like there's a much longer <laughs> battle sequence or something it was four hours like the- at, at one point it was four hours so wow. <laughs> I can believe it yeah I can believe it for sure. All right, that was my conversation with Dan Orkin, who, if you didn't pick up on it, is all the way in Scotland these days, and Michael Lux, who is over in Chicago at Reverb's World Headquarters. Again, the movie is called The Pedal Movie. Check it out, and thank you, as always, for tuning in.